Uh, we want to welcome everyone to another noon conversation. It's good to see some of you we haven't seen for a little bit, and we're grateful you're here, whether you're live or later. We are really, we really appreciate the connection. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then Nick will lead us. Oh, Father, uh, we come to you at this noontime hour on such a beautiful day, thanking you yeah. and praising you for who you are, your loving kindness towards us when you came to rescue us when we were still yet sinners and still are, and you continue to be our savior and guide. So Father, be with our conversation today. I thank you for each one that comes on this call or watches later. Father, I pray that they would continue to grow as they are discipling others and as, as they are being discipled, Father, as we wanna be the people you want us to be so that we can reach the world for Jesus. So we thank you for this connection together and I pray continued blessing and protection over Nick and his family as they leave the region. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Nick. Thank you, Colleen, appreciate that. And welcome everybody. So, you know, today, today, Today we're going to have a discussion and, and probably not just go around the table, um, but there's some big things coming up here in the next couple of months, uh, a couple of weeks, a couple of months. So um, I guess to start, let me let me do this. Um, for those of you who know, knew um, Marty Martin, he passed away this weekend. Um, so just letting you know that that'll be coming out in the news. I don't think it went out yet, but it will be. Um, so I want to I want to make sure I say that right up front for those of you if you can be in prayer for the family and so forth that would be wonderful. Um, I just didn't want to miss that as I talk about other things. So uh, the thing I really want to chat with you about is in the upcoming weeks we are going to be having um, further movement. Let me say that on the discipleship culture in the ERC. So many of you are aware there is a um, leadership retreat coming up for the Ad Council and the Commission Chairman. Uh, that will be taking place in later, later in July. Uh, my challenge to them and the challenge that I will issue to each of you uh, is the same. And that is, I want everybody that's attending that particular meeting to read through the four gospels, uh, the four gospel accounts, and read it not just with an eye of, I've always read this before, but read it for an eye of what is Christ teaching us and what is our current practice? So from each of your perspectives, I'm challenging you, read the four Gospels, the four Gospel accounts. Sorry, am I back? Read the four Gospel accounts, but read it with an eye to saying, okay, Jesus taught us this. Are we doing it or are we doing something else? You know, Jesus taught that this is what it means to be saved. Are we teaching that or are we teaching something else? Jesus taught, it, taught us what it meant to gather as believers. Are we doing that or are we doing something else? And, and from the collective body, the beautiful thing about it is, as each one of us do that and we, we discern different things and we pick up different things in our own, you know, makeup and wisdom that God has given us, I'm going to ask you to be a part of this process. Share that information. Um. Because, you know, the Holy Spirit may be speaking into you based on your context in an entirely different way than anybody else is seeing it. So, so you know, I'm going to challenge each of you re and, and anybody watching this uh, video later. I want you to read through those four Gospels with a sharp eye towards what is our current practice and does our current practice in, in the churches of God look like what Christ taught? Okay, so that's what I'm going to challenge each of you to do. Um, and I think that you'll find in a prayerful, thoughtful way, as you do that, you're going to see some things revealed to you that, that may surprise you. So, uh, and, and any input that you have, as you go through that, please share it with me. And I will take that input to this retreat that's happening at the end of July, because we're going to be making some decisions on a lot of things, including how we train pastors, what we expect of pastors, um, you know, what it means to be in good standing as we go forward, because basically what we're what I think you're going to find is we're going to shift more and more from sort of a um, preaching, teaching centric model to a discipleship model where the pastor understands, yes, they are the preacher and the teacher, but they also are sort of supervising a collective group, a team of people who are discipling people. Um, and if we miss that discipleship part, then literally we have missed everything that Christ called us to do because he didn't 
teach. He didn't call us to simply teach in his name. He, he called us to make disciples in his name. And so we've got to live this out. We've got to live it with integrity. We've got to show the world if we're going to have any. I had an interesting conversation. I think I shared with you a couple of weeks ago at one church. They asked me to come in and talk about revival. And you cannot talk about revival in the church until you talk about discipleship. You cannot have revival in the church until we are the ones living out and showing the world a different opportunity for them. And then as we soften the soil, we start to get more and more people who can become in tune with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit can move. Now, please don't hear me say the Holy Spirit can't move without us. I am not saying that. I'm simply saying that the scriptures tell us we have an we have an obligation to be the salt and light to the world, to soften that soil, soften those hearts, to allow that revival to move. So let's do our part so that the Holy Spirit can do their part. So that's that's the one piece of it. Read the four Gospels. The other piece of it that we're really going to focus on, and I, I just ordered a book that I'm going to be handing out to um, everybody who attends this that I'm going to expect them to read. It's a very short read. It's called the Discipleship Gospel, and it comes from discipleship.org. And I think basically it's a summary of Bill Hall's book from back in the early 80s, The, um, the Disciple-Making Pastor, I believe it was called. Uh, and But what this book stresses is we have, um, we, we have probably, I don't know, we probably have a ton of Gospels, but we have five probably major Gospels in the United States that have made their way into our traditions and into our culture and so forth. And when I say our traditions, I'm talking about the traditions of this church, you know, whether it's churches of God, Methodist, whatever, um, Baptist, whatever it is, these gospels have made their way in and they are not gospels of Jesus Christ. They are twists on that. They are false gospels. So we all know you have the prosperity gospel um, that's being preached. We, we have the consumer gospel that's being preached in a lot of churches um, you know, where you want to entertain people and bring in big numbers, but you don't really want to tell them, you know, what it really means to be a follower of Jesus. We have a liberal gospel, certainly that's that's warping things. We have a conservative gospel that is truly warping things as well. Um, equal to the evils of the liberal gospel, the conservative gospel lives in the land of legalism and Pharisee. Um, and, and of course, we know how Christ preached against that. Sometimes we think the liberal gospel is worse. It's not. They're both bad because they're not true. Um, and I don't know which one I forgot, but I forgot one of them. So the book goes through these other gospels and brings us back to a focus on Jesus Christ. Uh, and so those readings will sort of govern the direction of the conversation. But what I'm going to be challenging Ad Council and the leadership of the East to say is what are the next steps that have to be taken so that we can turn back to doing what Jesus Christ called us to do, and that is to make disciples. Because if we keep teaching people about Christ and not living as he, you know, in obedience to Christ and not being that example of salt and light, that's what brings us to that place we're at right now, where society is turning away from religion, where society, you know, the numbers in our churches are declining. You know, nobody wants, you know, nobody wants Christianity because all they see is hypocrisy. So it really is about us living this out. Um, and so that that's coming up. And this is big. I mean, this is going to really impact. Virtually every commission, it's going to virtual. It's going to definitely impact how we credential pastors. It's definitely going to impact who we let through the door for credentials, because unless someone comes to the table understanding the importance of discipleship and obedience to Christ in their lives, it doesn't matter if they have a PhD, a master's degree, or can quote every scripture, you know, word for word from the Bible. They have to be living it and setting the example. And if they can't live it and set the example, then they can go do other things, but they cannot lead a congregation. So uh, I hope you hear my intensity as I speak to you, because it is really going to change the way we um, minister in the churches of God. We are going to look a lot more like Christ and a lot less like society. And, okay, and so the, the that, what was the name of that book again? And do you know who wrote it? It's a discipleship gospel. And it was Bill Hall. And I can't remember. The, there's two authors that wrote it. He's, he's one of them. So if you want to grab that and pull that link yep. up, um, it's hit, actually Colleen. It's him publications. H I M publications will take you to the. Is he the other author? Yes, I just googled Thanks. it. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. So th this is really critical. Oh, okay. it's what we've seen in the last, you know, the last year with COVID and everything, we've seen some really bizarre teachings out there. We've seen the influence of politics in our churches. Um, we've seen some things that just are not scripturally sound. And what we've got to do is, is call that out where we see it, 
um, go back to Christ and say, what, you know, what's Jesus telling us in this situation? Um, and we really, truly have to move away from uh, allowing the, the, the world to influence us. We are supposed to be influencing the world. So um, that's a long introduction and, and I'm happy. I, as a matter of fact, I really want to talk to you about this. Uh, it may be more expensive on Amazon, actually, Conley. And that's why I said go to the Hymn Publications. Okay. I think it's cheaper. So I'm going to I'm going to launch there and we're going to move around. And, and uh, you know, first of all, I want to open it up. If anybody has anything they'd like to share, questions they'd like to ask. Um, you know, Victor, I don't know if you have anything you want to add, because your ministry is so set up around discipleship. I mean, it is like you take disciple out of your ministry and, and it, it, there's nothing left. I mean, it seems like that's all you're doing. So I don't know if you have anything you'd like to add to the conversation, what you're seeing in terms of lives being changed through your discipleship ministry. Uh, yeah, man, I, I tell you, I'm, I'm really like, it's just blowing me away right now. Um, so, you know, so we, we walk them through the process and now we just have a, a we have a group who have now become disciple makers, right? And and just recently, I think this was like last week, one of those leaders who who now is a disciple maker uh, led her first soul to Jesus, to Christ. And it was one of her coworkers. And it was so funny because, you know, one of the things I intentionally do is that I make everyone lead me to Christ. So, so they gotta know how to lead me to Christ. And so, um, and that's something we do in our training center. And so, so she was witnessing to this, um, one of her coworkers and she was like, well, you know, she was tired, all those things. And she was like, well, do you want to give your heart to Christ? And the lady said, yes. And it like blew her away. Like, oh my God, <laughs> she said, yes. <laughs> and that was just so huge for us, for her to come back and share because, you know, that, you know, that just blew her away that, you know, she said, yes, I do want Christ. And so now she's locking that person in. Uh, we're getting ready to give her a, a, a discipleship book. And, and now she's getting ready to walk her out where somebody has walked with her. Now she's walking with somebody else now. And so that, you know, that was like, man, that just blessed us last week. And to see this whole process of now you know, the disciple makers who now, I mean, they hungry too, man. I'm like, that, that just stirred me up, you know, when I got that call and just to hear her tell that story. So, so yeah. And, and uh, we're excited that, you know, we're, uh, we're sending. And, and so, um, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking real soon. I'm getting ready to start to get back out a little bit and, and I'm going to be going to, our new locations that we're planning, our micro churches, and and there uh, and uh, several of them are in different states, and so so I'm excited to see multiplication and all those things. But it takes time, and that's one of the things I, I got it. I can't emphasize enough. It has to be relational, and it's a process, mm -hmm. you know, and 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 accountability, and uh, and now we're really seeing the fruits of you know we were intentional through COVID. And now, you know, we had an ordination a month ago and, and, and to see the ordination and see people just, you know, growing and, and, and you know, stepping up. So, so yeah, so that's kind of where we are right now. That's great, Victor. And I want to, for those that may not be aware, I mean, you know, the, 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 the ministry that Victor's conducting right now, I want you all to take a look at it. And I think we Victor, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're going to be one of the stories that's going to be told, I think, through the videos that we'll be able to share. Yes. All right. So, but y'all, I really want you to see this because what Victor's doing is very different than what's happening in a lot of the churches. Our, you know, a lot of, the, of, of our more traditional churches still send to, tend to be sort of that church-centric thinking, which is not wrong by any means. It's just what we're used to, right? Victor offers this alternative, basically. So he goes in, you know... Uh, and I don't want to make it sound like it's simply the prison ministry, because I think it's a lot more than that. But, you know, he goes into these prison ministry situations working with people. But understand, it's a screening process first. Right. Come to the table. I'm going to see what you've got. There's a screening process first. And as they walk through the first phase of this, um, this program, Fathers on the Move, there's this understanding about 
the heart of that person, understanding about, you know, are they sincere? Are they playing games? What are they doing? What are their skills? These are things we all should be doing, right? I, I, and I hate, use, I hate quoting something out of a book when I read it fresh, but boy, it, it really stuck with me. We're looking for fourth soilers, right? We're looking for those that when we pour our time and attention into them, they're going to be the ones that produce 60 and 80 and 100 times, right? And so there's this screening process that goes on. And then if they cut through that, you know, no matter who comes through that program, they're going to be better than when they enter. But now they've also been screened. So now they can move on to other pieces of it. So what you find is he's got this discipleship making program that's in place. And Victor, how many states are you in now? It started in where? Um, North, North Carolina. Yeah, but. Yeah, yeah. Where are um, you? Charlotte, yeah. where are you? Yeah, it started in um, in Chapel Hill. Chapel Hill. And, yeah. And um, and now um, we're um, Pennsylvania, York, that is, Jacksonville, Florida, um, Virginia Beach. Um, Something um, California, right? Yeah, we're, we're definitely we're uh, going to California. Um, matter of fact, I'm already talking with Timothy Welch, mm -hmm. the, the young guy, the director out in the California eldership. Uh, we are already you know, talking and, and, and working things together too. And so, um, and um, yeah, it's, it's really South Carolina. Um, we're, as a matter of fact, we're in three um, cities in South Carolina. And so, um, so yeah, um, uh, Georgia. So we're, we're going in Georgia as well. And so, um, and, and you know, Nick, you said something. Let me show you how radical this thing is becoming. You know, you know, I'm about partnerships. And one of our biggest partners is the sheriff department, right? Me and the sheriff work directly together. They are building a brand new state-of-the-art jail, which is actually getting ready to open probably in the next couple of weeks. You know what he did? He built a baptism pool in the jail. I said, work <laughs> Jesus. Do you hear me? You know, if, if that ain't work Jesus for real, he like, he's like, Glover, look, when you bring your team in, go ahead and dunk them too. <laughs> I said, go ahead, Lord. So, I mean, we're seeing a radical, I mean, you know, and we got new prisons that are calling us. I mean, we just got through wrapping in the Great Lakes. We we got a prison up there. And, um, you know, I'm talking with the Great Lakes Commission uh, folks and Earl and all those guys. And um, matter of fact, our lead guy, oh, Finley, Ohio is one of our locations. Um and, and that's a whole testimony right there. We just met with the sheriff in Finley last week. So we already on the ground getting ready to mobilize in Finley, Ohio. So, so yeah, so, I, I mean, it's just so humbling right now, for real. No, I appreciate it, Victor. Thank you. And I, and I wanted you all to hear that um, because, again, it's a good example that, in fact, when we do it Jesus' way, it, it, it's going to prosper, right? And so um, probably within the last two weeks, I've had a conversation about a church that we've been struggling over. Like, what are we going to do with this church? Downtown Harrisburg, no parking. The building's in disrepair. It's in really bad shape. Then we pour money into it and try to keep the little congregation alive. What do we do? And through that conversation, you know, we said, wait a minute, we're thinking about this all wrong. We're th we're, even, even I get caught up in thinking Sunday centric way too much, right? And so we started saying, what if we use that church as a discipleship center? And it fits right into what we've been saying, right? So now we turn that into a Sunday, you know, we're not, you know, Sunday morning is a part of it, but as a discipleship center, and we grant, we give them the challenge and say, you know what, in five years, we want you to plant 20 churches in the city of Harrisburg, urban ministry churches. So in order to do that, your ministry has to look completely different. It has to look a whole lot more like what Victor's doing nationwide. And a lot less like, come on in, sit in the pews, let me teach you something, and then let's see if it takes hold, right? It's got to be a, a screening process where you're getting people in with the intent of saying 20 planted churches. And don't think I'm talking about more Sunday morning congregations in big buildings. I have no idea what that's going to look like, right? It could be a lot of house churches. It could be whatever. It could be starting a movement throughout the city of Harrisburg. So all of our churches need to be looking at things in that way, not how to get more people in your pews, but how to get more people into your discipleship so that you can send them out and get more done in the kingdom. Because multiplication can't happen if we're trying to fill pews. 
we need to be filling discipleship programs. And that's where the context comes in, in terms of every church is going to have a different context of what a discipleship program looks like, what works for you. Who are you reaching out to? What do those people look like? What are their passions? What are their gifts? And what are their capabilities in the kingdom? But this is all about discipleship. It's not about just teaching. Teaching doesn't get us there. Teaching is a foundation that moves us through discipleship, but it's got to be, how does this practically apply? And so, you know, you've heard me talk about the credential, that credentialing process. I'm also going to talk to you about the training process. So like MTI and Weinbrenner, you know, both those programs and every other seminary that we work with is going to have to look more like a Votech education than a high theology education, Right. So the candidates are still going to have to come in and know their theology. There's no question about that. But they're also going to have to come in understanding my responsibility if I get a job, you know, if, I, if I'm able to get a job in my calling area, right? So in, order, in other words, I'm going to be responsible for a church. Then they better understand that their job is to make disciples and not just preach a message on Sunday morning, right? That's important. That's really, really important that people understand that. So the paradigm is going to shift a lot, not to say that our pastors aren't discipling. I'm not saying that at all. I'm simply saying we need to make it more of a absolute that people understand and, and they know that, you know, we're not we're not called to preach. We're called to make disciples. What does that take? Sometimes it's preaching. Sometimes it's teaching. A lot of times it's being there and helping a person work through a situation that they're going through in a scripturally sound way, teaching them in that manner. Very practical. Right. So that we, we've got to get a lot better at that. Um, the other thing that I'm going to I'm going to ask you as you read through the Gospels, take a hard look at because um, if you look at what Jesus says about how how you are saved, if you look at how Jesus taught the disciples how you are saved, you're going to start to understand that in a lot of ways the sinner's prayer is used in a very unbiblical way. Now, I'm not going to tell you, you know, I'm going to let you wrestle with that one on your own. But for far too long, we've put a lot of effort into a sinner's prayer that Christ would have said doesn't cut it. There's a heck of a lot more to it. And I know that, you know, depending on how you walk down that road, as you read his words, his words never, ever venture towards a works-based salvation. But it does say follow me. It does say it's not just about your mouth. It's about your actions. And sometimes we cut that short too. So please, 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 as you're reading, as I challenge you to read through those gospels, as you read through Christ's teachings, make sure you're weighing also what we're teaching people about salvation. Because the one thing that I personally don't want to have to answer for on, on judgment day is that I never even showed the people that I talked to the narrow path. I never got them there, let alone have them walk down it. But I never got them to the path. They never got to see it because I wasn't being salt and light that Christ called me to be. And every pastor should be convicted by that. Every pastor should read that book of James and talk about, you know, if you are so bold to step up into that role of a teacher, you better understand that that bar set really high. So again, my challenge back to you is read those gospels, um, I would love to hear your thoughts and, and your perspectives on where we are and the things that you believe we need to change. Um, and I'm happy to carry that information to, the, again, this leadership retreat. We certainly in one day won't cover everything, but we can cover a lot of ground in that leadership retreat. So, all right. Thanks, Victor. Appreciate it. Um, going around. Uh, let, hey, Chuck, you're next to me. So I'm just going to start with you. What's going on, man? What questions do you have or thoughts do you want to share? Are you with us? Are you, talk, are you talking to me? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. I, <laughs> I, usually, know, I didn't hear the name. No, that's all right. I usually backload staff, but I'm calling you up front. So <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, you know. Anyway, uh, what would I like to say? I'd like to say that uh, this weekend had a really a great opportunity to talk to, go to, go to on site to some of our churches with uh, uh, and, and future churches, including a, a virtual church. and. Uh, and Mike Schooley's church up there in Elmira, and Jeremy Kramer's up there in Elmira as well, and uh, 
Pat and had a chance to share a discipling. I, I discipled Pat yesterday in an ice cream meeting. And I think it, uh, I think it went okay. Uh, we, we, we thought we did, we, we did a toast to Nick in the middle of our first gulp of ice cream. So, you know, we were thinking of you. And, uh, but, you know, the one thing, uh, it was just, just to see Christ worship in so many different ways. And I mean, the hub was incredible yesterday. It was a graduate Sunday. And uh, I honestly, I told Jeremy walking out, I actually felt I was part of your family, which I think is a key element of disciple making that we're feeling that, you know, I belong here. And that I, I this God, I, I, I want to wor- I worship and I, and I love. And uh, they, they did it by just such simple ways as, as showing, uh, getting into the graduates' lives and, and, and dealing with the issues that they were dealing and some of the great things that God's still doing in their lives and uh, the challenges of the future ahead as they graduate and now move on to uh, a couple of them into the medical field. And uh, it was just, I, I can't, I just, it was like, I walked out of there just on a high, just thinking, you yeah, know, this is what the body should be like, where we're caring for each other. E- even if we, we aren't living together physically, we're still caring for each other and still we're loving each other and, and encouraging each other. And, uh, and, and these graduates, these high school graduates and one was a college graduate, knew when they were walking out of there that they were walking out. They may be walking out, but they're not going to be forgotten. And that that body of Christ believers is, is going to be praying for them and uh, continuing to, to be the church for them and to be, uh, to be in their lives as, as, as Christ followers. And, uh, and then you go down and see Pat and all that's going on down there and hear Hear the great stories, and uh, it was just it was an incredible weekend. And both Dennis, Dennis Ricketts and I just had a wonderful time, just seeing the body of Christ discipling each other like it really truly should be. Now, I appreciate that, Chuck. You know, it was funny. Um, Steph and I spent the weekend at Colonel Dunning State Park, and as we were driving from there down to Yoakum Town for her to preach yesterday morning, we were passing by all our, of our rural churches up in that that Newville area. And it really struck us about how, you know, when you think about, you know, churches formed around community, like you said, it formed around family, it formed around community. These were like so many little churches popped up in these little towns. And it was really this intimate network of of people who really knew each other well. And that's one of the challenges we're up against now as we as we get into a society that more and more is is like, um, uh, what I want to say, standoffish, they, you know, they don't. You know, we're not engaging with each other as much. We don't know each other as well. Uh, Community bonds are breaking down. All of a sudden, churches become, you know, they draw from large geographic regions and you just don't have that same level of intimacy that you used to have when it was, okay, new community, new church, new community, new church. Mm -hmm. And to to a degree, that's kind of what we're trying to get back to. You know, when we say about planting churches in, in, you know, neighborhoods of urban centers and stuff like that. It's getting back to those intimate environments where we know everybody that know what's going on. We know what the problems are. So thank you for sharing. Cause that Almira story is a great one. Appreciate it. It's good stuff. Pat Ferris. Live and in person. Yes, sir. How are you um, doing today? To me at church, our building is falling down and we don't care. That's just the hub of where we're launching everything out of. Uh, to us, the congregation is more than in the building. It's in the streets. It's at the Nobles. It's in the homeless camps we go to. That's where our ministry goes. We we're talking of this Chuck yesterday. Today. My ministry is more than that building. Mm-hmm. Um, I have seven cookouts I'm going to in the next couple of weeks with members of the building and the other places I go. They've invited me into their yards for cookouts and birthday parties. To me, that's the whole key central. Know the people. And not be afraid to say yes. Um, I had one woman say to me, well, I would have invited you, Pastor, but my family, you know, they like to drink and swear, and I don't think how you'd like it. And I said to her, who did Jesus eat with? (laughs) And she's like, you know, I never thought about that. I says, let me explain something to you. I says, I may not be paid as a pastor, but I'm Southern. We never starve. So somebody offers up a free meal and a time to fellowship, a time to talk Jesus, guess who's going to be there? Just like Brother Victor would be, right? Free food and fishing, and it's a way to bring God. You know, you, you, that's the key. And Nick, you said it. Do we know our people? Um, I just said this to Chuck yesterday. I said, Chuck, I've sat in churches of two hundred, where it's almost impossible to know the people. 
I sit in a church of 30. I know the people. I know. I try to remember birthdays. I remember anniversaries. I remember key dates. Um, I just re- try to remember key essential things that make a connection. Hey, it's their birthday. We make it. We make a notice of it. Um, I had a couple I married last year. My in this church. I remember their anniversary. I made a big deal out of it. Uh, we got one family that's having a birthday tomorrow. I'm going to their house to have a birthday with them because they have no immediate family. I'm going from there to one of my leaders' houses for her mom's birthday, Ashley Don's mom's birthday tomorrow. So tomorrow I have two birthday parties to go to. It's not the food I'm going for. It's how can I bring Christ to family members that may have never heard about Christ? You all know me. I'm just about Jesus. I don't care where I am. Um, if it's Knobles, if it's in the middle of uh, Turkey Hill, if it's in the middle of Walmart, standing in the line, I'm speaking Jesus. You know, um, I was in Walmart the other day. I had to go grocery shopping, and I hate grocery, and I'll tell you all that right now. But I like the fact that Walmart's only has two registers open on a Saturday morning. Because I'll tell you how much Jesus you can talk to. A lot of people do walk away eventually. Oh, they forgot something. But others will stand there, and they may not indirectly listen, but they're hearing. So um, we have a one, two, two, one plan, meaning um, I was talking to Chuck about this yesterday today. I've discipled a few people in my church, and I'll use Brian Madden, for example. Brian Madden now has taken two under his wing. He's discipling. Um, so we were doing one person, and that one person is taking on one or two more people, and we're just going to keep expanding out. So we basically have a big old tree. You know, like Christ said, I am the vine from me as many branches. Well, that's how discipleship should be. We need one center point, and then launching out King Jesus is the center point. We're just trying to launch out from there and build a lot of vines. So, Man, I, I love, Pat, the idea of the backyard barbecues and the birthday parties because, again, you know, one of the struggles when I came here was the 50-hour contract, right? So churches were, were expecting these pastors to put in their 50 hours, and, and most of them expected that 50 hours to be inside the building. And I said from the start, that, that's absurd. That's completely absurd. I like, like where the pastor should be is backyard barbecues. Like, you know, you should be out there bringing, bringing the word. Um, but even more than that, building the relationships that ultimately result in pathways that allow you to open up and bring the word, right? Because again, the whole thing is structured around being the example first. And once you build the relationship through the example, now you have the right to talk, right? But first you have to be the example. Um, and so that's good. I mean, I love that. I hope people hear that because realistically, um, and, and, and again, I don't, as an introvert myself, I don't say this to make anybody feel bad because some people would not be comfortable in that setting and that's fine. But somebody better be taking that evangelistic side where they're going out and really getting to know the congregation on the team. You know what I mean? And that's what it's about. It's about building a team. And I think you've done that up there. So thanks, Pat. Appreciate that. That's wonderful. I'm going to jump down to Matt. Altoona. Boy, well, just trying to soak in everything that's going on here today. Um, And there's a lot. And the transitioning, you know, from the generations that have been in our smaller churches and the way they've been taught, the way that the church operates, and now to change that to that discipleship-centered ministry, you're going to have to take the the quote-unquote leaders of that church who think that the making sure the lights are on, the doors are locked, and this is that, and that's this, and now have them see themselves as a disciple of Jesus Christ first, Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And the call to go and make a disciple with my neighbor, with my, and have the cookout at my house so I can preach Jesus to my neighbor that I haven't talked to but three times in the last four years, you know, and to see that as that's who I am, and that's a big transition. And so when you have your your meeting at your training in that how how to get a pastor with our mission, the discovery part, to discover, develop, and deploy, discover part. Of, of the pastor's job is to discover, to pray with the leaders of that body to discover spiritual gifts. I'm going to come to your house. We're going to pray. We're going to read through scripture and we're going to discover what the Holy Spirit is doing in you. And then we're going to deploy that into your neighborhood. And, and that, that is that role for the pastor 
And that's a big deal because mm. that puts the, the pastor's circle pretty small, but intense. And to have an intense, passionate, Christ-filled relationship with a dozen people that are going to go out to another dozen people and for them to see themselves not as the traditional leader of the church in the way they have been thinking, but themselves as disciples called to make disciples. And that's a big change. And, and I'm just, I'm just so blessed to be a part of that because that's where the whole growth is. And, and our city is actually working on that with this whole unified church that saturate Altoona, which we thought we were going to get a couple hundred people down by the train station on Sunday nights. I think we cracked a thousand people last night. Oh my goodness. For two hours of praise Ooh. and worship. That's all it was. Oh my goodness. And, uh, and each week the church is like 22 or 23 set up tables. So you could come from anywhere. Just come walk through the pavilion. You feed you, give you something to drink, give you a place to sit down. And there were pastors around with little lanyards on that if you needed prayer, you could just go. And we just open up and that the church doesn't have walls. So that was, this was week two. And we have two more weeks to go to see where the Lord's taking it. So it's actually kind of, you know, like what Victor said, you, you just take that step of faith and let the Lord do it and he'll do something that just blows your mind. And uh, it's just been, it's been really good that way. And you get these relationships now with some of these older pastors and different pastors from different faith traditions. And it's been really, really good. Um, so we've been busy up here. We've had a love feast where we went down to help one of the Methodist church because they serve lunches on Saturdays, but staff and COVID and stuff, and they can't get it. So we go down there expecting to serve 60 or 80 pe people lunch. We ran out of food. We had 120 lunches we handed out and um, got to pray. Parking lot prayers are wonderful where you get to walk out and talk to people in their, in their situations. Say, How can I pray for you? And this one, uh, this one sticks in my head, a grandmother who's raising six of her own grandchildren. And she has three other foster children. She's got nine kids in one of those big, long vans. And um, she came up to get to, to be fed. So we gave her all the lunches. But boy, we had a, this spontaneous prayer meeting with all these screaming kids in this van. It was it just made the day. It was fun. So, you know, it's, it's fun getting out and uh, being a part of the community. And that's what we're called to be. We got to open these doors up, tear these walls down and start getting out. And I'm just excited to be a part of that. That is, that, that, that's again, amazing. And um, as we talk about, you know, as we talk about the shift, you're right. It's a heavy burden that, that in a lot of ways, it's a retraining. Mm -hmm. um, but I want people to understand that, that we don't lose sight of the fact that we're still, those that are gifted in particular ways just have to find their piece of what it means. Right. With exactly. The Bible, right. Mm -hmm. So the trustees and so forth, the people that are really focused on the building, they still have a place, right? Yeah. They still have, they still have an important place. Um, it, you know, they're, 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 they're basically resourcing the ministry that's taking right. place by caring for the building and being good stewards and stuff. So I don't want to make it sound like, you know, there's not room for all, all personality types, all giftedness and so forth, but man, oh man, you're right. We've got a big job ahead of us, helping people understand under a new paradigm. What does that look like? How, how do people fit? Um, and it, you know, it's, it's, it's somewhat unfortunate. And this is something we're going to have to really attack. There's some churches where the people in charge of the building and the facilities dictate the ministry. Yeah. That's probably not healthy. That's, you know, again, when you're on the sort of the buildings and ground side and the budget side, it's not so much to say yes or no to ministry. It's to listen to the ministry needs that are being discerned by the eldership and then figure out a way to make it happen. Right. And, and so we, you're right, Matt, we, we have a big job ahead of us, and I don't want anybody to be intimidated by it, um, but it's a big job. But that's where we're going, and that we're, we're getting back to Scripture. We're getting back to this idea where, you know, there's not an American gospel. There's not, a, you know, there's not a, a, a consumer gospel. There's not all these different gospels. There is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the one authority on heaven and on earth. Um, you know, that's where we're going. So. But man, oh man, a thousand people showed up. That is amazing. If you go to Saturate Altoona, you'll see that you'll see the sites. They might even have some of it on video. But yeah, it was it was it was pretty incredible. I Very cool. Count. Yeah. Very cool. Thanks. Um, Colleen, you're next on my list. 
Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, actually, you know, I just got back from some wonderful bonding time with my daughter and granddaughters at the beach, and I considered it holy. <laughs> You know, it was just really, really special. And, uh, you know, yeah, it was great. It's just really, really great relational. You know, I don't get to see them a whole lot because they live in about an hour away. And so it was just special, really, really special. So I got a, a rest from Karen for mom and dad. My siblings came in and took care of them. And that worked out pretty good. A little bit of rebellion on their part, but... <laughs> <laughs> But it worked out. So, yeah. Yep. Looking forward to my new role and, um, you know, starting to get my feet wet with that for looking after the pastors and getting some opportunities. And God's given me some ideas and I'm excited about that. So. No, that's great. And, and again, there's a lot of pastor care that needs to be done and we got to get better at that. So I'm looking forward to the challenges before you as well. So yeah. good to hear you had a good weekend, though. Thanks. Uh, right. Quick question. Uh, Miss Miss. Colleen, what, what is your uh, new role okay. consisting of? Well, um, actually what I'm going to be doing, Victor, is it's almost like caregiving for the pastors. So there is a, I'll be, you know, linking uh, directly with the Pastoral Family Health Commission and coordinating care and getting resources to the right people who need it or help where they need it and uh, being intentional um, in working with the pastors and their families. And if they communicate that there is an issue with the churches, then Dave and I will work very closely together to make sure that the church health commission then addresses the church issues uh, to help the pastor and his family to be healthier. So um, it's, it's really going to be a very coordinated effort, um, you know, to make sure that um, the pastors are not struggling alone so that they know they're not alone. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to it. It might not be me that is necessarily the one person that they would go to, but I'm going to be tasked with finding the right person that should be their person to go to, um, to get um, help to know that they're not alone. So, yeah. It, it, and, and again, one of the shifts that we're making on, on how we staff and how we operate is making sure that um, the, the pastors who have been disconnected from the ERC, you know, we've got, we've got 148, 100, 145, 148 churches. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of those churches have very little interaction with the ERC. And that can mean a lot of different things. But one thing we don't want it to mean is that they believe that there's a lack of interest or a lack of support for them. And so one of the major initiatives that's happening right now outside of the discipleship initiative, but maybe a piece of it, and that is building a network. Think of it as a net or a mesh where it may not be directly a staff person at the ERC. It might be a lead team or it may be a ministerium. It may be something else. But in some way, we're tracking, um, you know, uh, you know, Victor, if you're the point person for every every one of our southern churches, southeast churches, then we know that they're connecting with you on a monthly basis and you're checking out to see if they're how they're doing. Colleen's going to call you and say, hey, is there anything down there that I need to know about, right? So it, it may not be a direct connect, but it's absolutely, we need to have a connection to all of our churches if they're part of the ERC, right? And it doesn't matter where they are, uh, you know, we, we, we've kind of, you know, it's, it's so strange to me. It's written in the Constitution, for instance, that every pastor that's ordained has to come to conference. Well, that's great, but if you spend the entire rest of the year not connected, that one time we all get together as a family really doesn't mean a whole lot. So we want to be there. We want to know when, when, you know, you lose a family member or when you're having a rough time with your spouse or, you know, God forbid there, you, you have some things going on in your congregation that they're overwhelming. Like we want to be there and bring resources to the table. And so Colleen's really the point person to make sure that the human beings that call themselves pastors in the ERC, that they're being cared for and that their families are being cared for. Right. right. So, and that's an important part of this. If we're going to get back to health, which is the challenge before us, we're going to get back to health as a region. And we need to make sure our pastors are being cared for appropriately. And, and that they're healthy. I mean, you know, and you know, uh, one of the things that Victor, I, I want to reassure you, because I know this is a big thing for you that 
the the generosity piece sometimes will come out as I'm speaking to a pastor and you know the Holy Spirit will lead it that way and when he leads it that way I I, I have to speak into that but it's not going to be a lead-in for me obviously you know um, you never you never lead in that way but it does go to um, being a fully formed disciple you know and um, so that will be a part of you know, as the Holy Spirit opens things up, but this is going to have to be a Holy Spirit movement. I mean, and, and absolutely as he's opening doors that he shows me, um, you know, what it is I need to discuss. I mean, and he will do that. I mean, I have, you know, um, empathy and I actually feel things that people might not, um, initially communicate. Um, and then that will be the Holy Spirit opening a door where I need to go in and, and speak honestly and openly, you know, it's not going to be a hand-holding thing. It's going to be a discipling um, process with the pastors and their families. Amen. And, and you know what? It's needed. Yeah. I mean, we talked, we had our mobilization uh, commission meeting last week, um, you know, with, with Lance, you know, the whole team. And that was one of the things that came out is that, you know, a lot of our pastors need mentors. Who's mentoring that's right. Who's, who's speaking into their life? That's right. You know, who are they able to dump out to, you know, when they feel like they can't talk to certain people who, you know, they can't trust, you know, their most intimate situations, that, you know, personally. And that's so important, you know, and I, and I even spoke on the fact that, you know, I do mentor a few pastors in, in Pennsylvania. Right. You know, and, and it's important, you know, and uh, especially in this past COVID season, man, you know, and with depression and all this, all those things going on. So, you know, so I, I, I you know, that's a blessing. You, you're the right person for it, man. Oh, you're, Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Pray for Amen. me. Amen. Yes, okay. ma'am. We sure will. Thanks. You know, it's funny, Nick, because that was something you said to me when, when I joined a, a little over a year ago, was make sure you take other pastors on to help you mentor, have somebody to talk to and bounce ideas off of. And that's exactly what I did. You know, this is what we need. We can't do it on our own. So, and I like the fact that you're doing that, Colleen, and it's not being disrespectful. Let me put it in a Southern way. You'll bring the mom aspect to the table. <laughs> Sometimes that's what we as pastors, you know, male pastors, we just need that. There's a nurturing side that women can bring that men, we can't bring no matter how hard we try. It's not being disrespectful. It's just. Thank you for that encouragement. I appreciate that because actually I'm a, um, I'm a very fierce mother. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, it'll be sometimes tough love and, uh, but I do it in a way that, um, you know, I think that they'll hear me. So, yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. And I, and I think it's important too, just to say this, because again, remember, it's not just us gathered here. It's people that will watch us after, you know, somehow we have got to convince people that wearing masks as pastors is not healthy. And to some degree, it's, it's a lie, right? So we've got to get people to the place where they have a network around them where they can be themselves and know that our job, again, if you think about this in the discipleship culture, and, and I, would, I would say probably you all would agree with me, we've not been really good at this in the past in ERC. If a pastor falls down, there's a lot of times where that person's going to kind of be, I don't know, I, I, I don't think it's purposefully kicked to the curb, but there's a lot of times where we're just not going to know what to do with that person. But when that pastor falls down, whether it's, you know, something they've done or, or whatever it might be, that's a moment of this. That's where somebody needs to come alongside them and, and, and build their brother or sister up. Right. It's not a time to turn our backs and run away. It's a time to come alongside them. And, and whether they can return to ministry or not, isn't even an issue. What matters is, is the human being being cared for. And, and so we've really got to get to that place where pastors understand we're not trying to um, we're not trying to to uh, uh, yeah, I don't even know what to say judge in any way. What we're trying to do is make sure that support gets to where support is needed. We're trying to make sure that the health and well-being of that human being. We're trying to make sure because here's another thing, folks. And I got to tell you, I believe this. And you know, I'm not about to start pointing anywhere, but I, I really believe that there are people standing in the pulpit every Sunday morning that don't know Jesus, right? They, they think they know Jesus and, and they've checked off a lot of boxes to know Jesus, but I believe there are people out there that don't know Jesus. 
And so don't think for a moment we don't have a responsibility to look inside our churches and, and help people along when they're not expressing the things that um, Scripture would say that they would be expressing if they knew Jesus, right? So whether it's the fruit of the Spirit, whether it's, you know, this false front, whatever it is, there are certain things that, you know, if you're going to walk that narrow pathway, there are certain realities that Scripture points out you're going to have to do to be obedient. And so we want to make sure we're building an environment where people can tr be true to the word and be safe, um, knowing full well that if, if something's going on, uh, you know, family issues, whatever it might be, we're going to be there to help. So that's part of the challenge. Let's let's build people up. Let's not tear people down. And and where a brother falls or a sister falls, we want to be there to help them back up. So um, appreciate that. Uh, Frank, moving on to you. Uh, you know, my, my life in this particular season, uh, uh, for, for many years, uh, I was very active in the local church, uh, served as the council president and elder, and uh, very much part of the active ministry of the church. And several years ago, I kind of stepped back from some of that, uh, especially as I became uh, part-time with staff. Uh, at the conference, um, uh, and what I found uh, is while the church is doing a lot of good things, that sometimes uh, the process moves so slowly. Uh, it's got to go through layers of administration, and uh, and so what I'm finding, particular for myself right now, is uh, while the church is working through. Uh, discipleship um, I'm actually doing discipleship um, and uh, I'm praying for the church that that they'll work through it and come out you know with some uh, viable ministry uh, but until that time comes uh, you know, I just took it upon myself to, to seek what the Lord wanted me to do specifically in discipleship and found some people to disciple and some uh, opportunities to, to pray for people and to lead them in scripture study and uh, uh, just making an impact on some people's lives. And uh, I got a call from a lady just the other day, uh, one of the ladies that I'm kind of uh, reaching out to, uh, she claims to know the Lord, but, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not there to judge her, but uh, uh, she has a friend that, that's in desperate need. And, uh, you know, she just reached out to me to pray for her. Uh, so, I mean, at least in her life, I've made some sort of an impact. Uh, and that's where I'm at right now in my life. And, and Frank, that that's awesome, too. That's an awesome testimony, because I think there are a lot of people that are doing this already. And I think what's really important is if we're going to change the culture on a Broadway, those that are already doing it, those that already understand the importance of it really have to step up as the support that Matt even referred to, to the people who don't quite understand. Right. We've in a lot of ways, a lot of our churches have been run on programs for so long that people think they're, they're great because they checked off all the boxes and, and there's other people that can step up and speak into their lives and help them understand, look, but there's more, there's more. It, it gets even better. Let, let me help you to see that it gets even better. Um, and, and I think Frank, again, if, you know, I'd do the same thing. If I needed someone to pray, I'm, I'm calling you too, because I, I believe in the power of your prayers, even if I don't believe in the power of mine, sometimes <laughs> I believe in the power of your prayers, brother. So you just keep doing what you're doing. I love it. Um, let me let me do this. I'm going to go to Dean next, but I'm going to say to David that normally I don't um, call on people if the video is not on, only because I'm assuming that you, you're you working or you're listening in the background. So I'm going to go to Dean next. And then, uh, David, if you want to pop into the notes and simply say, if you have anything you want to share, uh, you, I'll, I'll get there. Um, Dean, how are things down south? Got on mute.
There you go. Yep. That's fantastic. We're having a great time. Uh, we got a big week for us coming up next week. And uh, one comment on the large churches and small churches, uh, I think Victor's on the move. He's doing all those different things and, and seeing overseeing all those things. I, I've learned to really love the large, large church. And uh, one of the things is, though, I haven't spoken in over a year, <laughs> but that doesn't bother me. Uh, right now, I'm penned in my room because the people are in my living room. <laughs> uh, the catch is we have about, about 148 churches now, and that's 148 pastors working on messages for next week. And uh, that's a lot of time used. I'm not opposed to it. I think it's fantastic. I think our small churches are needed in our community. I think they have great purpose by the same token. I, I love our large church because it allows us to do so many different kinds of things. Uh, one of the couples that we took not too long ago met, took along to church on Sunday morning for a young couple to go. We have a superior praise team. And uh, when the church service was over, uh, the young guy disappeared. And I turned around and then she disappeared. And I thought we, we were going to lunch with them, I thought. And then Nancy discovers that they're up front talking to the praise group. They're saying that they've gone to a lot of different musical things and all kinds of festivals. And, and they think these people are really good. And they came away uh, touched because of that. we got these young people in our society today that uh, we have to go about meeting them a little different. Uh, this came about because one of the questions I would really add to, to your discipleship program is as soon as anyone uh, really gets into our program and uh, is, starts to be out there and interested in making disciples, is we ask them, and I can walk up to them right now and say, who's your one? I want them to have some one person at least that they're praying for daily, that they're looking to assist that person to be a part of however it is that that person comes to the Lord. And so we, we, we push who's your one as well, so that all of our people that are working on being a disciple uh, have that one person. Of course, that's how we got the young people. Uh, we had invited them here for a weekend and then they came and then we got them to church and that, that was what we wanted uh, because uh, I don't know, we got to live the excitement. I think I hear Victor, I hear it on here a lot more lately, uh, Nick, that you folks are uh, excited. There's things happening. And that's what the new the church was like all those years ago. It was such an excitement that it touched people's lives. I think that's happening in the ERC now. I think, I think that's great. And I, if Frank Arbor's uh, really becoming that prayer guy. Man, I love to have a prayer guy on my team. I know that I got his name written down in my book. Uh, we're going to have almost 300 people out next week because four times a year we have serve week and we're going out and we get all kinds of serve things. One of our pastors that also never gets to speak anymore spends all this time setting up all these different opportunities. Uh, Nancy and I'll be working a laundromat. <laughs> we will uh, be there for uh, two hours, then we'll support some other people to take the next shifts. And uh, the object is we're there. We're, we're here today. It's our church loves to serve people. I want to pay to do your laundry today. What a nasty thing. What are they going to do while their laundry is being done? Oh, do you have a Bible? I got this one here. I'd like you to give this to you as a gift, and, I'll, and I'll, I won't bother you anymore. And then later on, because they talk to us, we talk with them. And before we part, of course, we're thing is, how can I pray for you? I, and... Uh, it's just an open door. Uh, we expect that we'll get more people this next week and the following week that we look to see them in our church or one of our other events. And the events are such as Nancy has women today in our house uh, because we invited people. Uh, hey, we have a couple people over. We're going to try these special dishes they're making today. I didn't try them yet today. I am hungry. I don't know if I want to try them. I heard about them. <laughs> But uh, they're out there, and they're having a good time, and then they're going to talk a little bit about a lady named Ruth. And uh, I, I just think that the coordination is coming within the churches of God. I find this so exciting. Nick, I'm happy for you and your whole team. you got a real good bunch of people there working. And, Victor, I'm excited about yours. Uh, we did that when we were in Florida. I, I, I spent more time in the kids' youth camp than most of the kids did. <laughs> 
<laughs> but it was it was fun. I'm having such a great time. You guys are making my dreams come true. Thank you. Thanks, Dean. Appreciate it. Um, so let me let me do this. Uh, David, do you want to do you want to share anything? I, I didn't see anything pop up in chat, but I'll give just a minute if you want to. You, you're certainly welcome to unmute. And if not, um, we'll just keep moving. Um, so, uh, yeah, man, we're we're actually over an hour today. That's that's pretty good. Pretty exciting stuff. A lot, lot of good things being talked about. Um, Hey, Nick. Yeah. Hey, just, just a prayer request. Uh, Jeff uh, Musser up there at uh, Round Knob and, and uh, the, other, the Northwestern District is going through some major surgeries to, uh, today and tomorrow. So, heart surgeries. So, mm. just keep him in our prayers. Yeah, definitely. How's Pastor Snyder doing? He's, st he's still in rehab. Okay. All right. Well, I think uh, I think we're just going to go ahead and, and uh, we'll close out. And um, hey, Frank, since since we gave you props today, would you mind praying us out th this uh, this afternoon? Sure. And I'll just ask you to keep the you know, Michael Martin's family in your prayers as well, if you if you would, please. Father. Uh... We just take a moment to quiet our hearts before you because, Lord, uh, we know that uh, all that we have or ever hope to have is a result of the generosity that you have shared with us. And, Lord, uh, when we think of generosity, we aren't thinking of material blessings, uh, but we think about how you have saved us from a, a life of darkness uh, that we once were lost, but now we're found. Uh, we were blind, but now we see. Uh, we thank you, Father, for uh, the men and women that have gone on before us that have uh, known you and have shared you with others. And Lord, we would pray now that as you have called us to be uh, disciples and disciple makers, uh, that we would not rely upon our own strength, uh, but that we would seek the power of the Holy Spirit, that we might go forward, not in self, uh, but in service to you uh, through the one who is greater than the one who is in the world. Uh, Lord, I would ask for forgiveness where we have fallen short, uh, where we have uh, taken on an initiative and tried to do it for the wrong reason, uh, where we wanted self-recognition or we wanted acclaim, uh, we ask that you would forgive us and that we might uh, truly surrender our will to your will, uh, knowing that when we're in obedience to your will, uh, great things will happen. Uh, Lord, I thank you for the men and women on this call uh, for their desire to uh, seek your face, uh, to share with others uh, what you have laid upon their heart. Uh, we're excited when we hear about things uh, that are happening in Altoona. We're excited about uh, the things that are happening in uh, prisons. Uh, we're excited about uh, big churches and little churches uh, that have captured the true vision of discipleship. Uh, and Lord, we would pray that uh, we would see the church not as a building, uh, not as a name on a sign, uh, but that we would truly see that each and every individual uh, is part of the body of Christ and that collectively we might go forward uh, proclaiming the good news and uh, deploying people into the world uh, to make a difference as we become more and more like you. Uh, help us, Father, to do that. And Father, we know that 
in this world, we will have troubles. Uh, we think of those that have been mentioned today, uh, specifically about the Martin family. Uh, we know that death is a reality, uh, but we rejoice knowing that uh, death is not the end, uh, but only the stepping stone into eternity with you. And so we would pray for the Martin family, that you would just be with them, uh, that you would give them hope and encouragement and fond memories, uh, and that the legacy that was left would be one that permeates uh, the many people that lives have been touched. Uh, and Lord, we look forward to that day uh, when we gather uh, around the throne uh, to rejoice uh, with our Savior and Lord and uh, be with those that have gone on before us. And there we will spend eternity. Uh, to that end, we say, come Lord Jesus and thanking you that you have uh, prepared the way for us. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thank you all for, for gathering today. I do love it when we, we can all get together. So just have a wonderful day. Um, we'll do this again tomorrow evening, Tuesday evening. Um, hope uh, many of you will return then. Uh, the, the presentation that I'll talk about is probably going to be very similar to the one I shared with you today to that group, but um, join the conversation. And maybe over 24 hours, you'll think of something you want to share, you know, with regards to discipleship. You're welcome at the table. Take care, everybody. Have a great day.